فاشرف بي لاشتغال بالعلم ولا تبغي به ما عشت يا ذا بدلا ويا له من شرف عظيم The remaining six that Ali uh, that he consulted and he took them as Ahl al-Shura Umar radiyallahu anhu didn't say everybody has to play in, put, place their voices in Where is the intikhabat that you're talking about in the election? These six, what, what, what conditions do they fulfill? The conditions of Ahlul Halli wal Aqd, which we spoke about. But some of them, they bring forward a story. The story that they bring forward is when Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu died, and the six, are you there? And the six, what would they do? The six were choosing whose names came up, came, came up. Two people's names came up to be elected, to be chosen as the leader, right? Who is it? Uthman and who? Uthman and who? Ali. Ali. So they bring a story that Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, and this story, half of the Hajar brings it in Fatul Bari. Imam al-Dahabi brings it in his Tariq al-Islam. Ibn Athir, he brings it in his Tariq. Ibn Jarir al-Tabari, he brings it in his Tariq al-Umami wal-Muluk. All of those, they don't have this story, this narrative that I'm going to mention now. They bring the story of Uthman, uh, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, but they don't have this narrative, I mean, this form that's put forward. Okay, pay attention. They don't have this. Their narration is different. And what is the one that these individuals propagate? They say that Abdul Rahman ibn Auf is the Shara al-Nisa. He also even consulted the women. And he consulted the people of Medina. And every single person who he consulted, they commanded him who? Uthman. So they say, look, look, that's election. What's he doing? He took the voices of every single person. Hadahu. That's an argument. Are you with me, brothers? This story of Abdurrahman ibn Auf consulting women wherever you find it you find it biduni salat without a chain Ibn Kathir brings it in Kitab al-Bidai wa Nihaya the fourth volume page 151 Sah brothers no chain so from based on that, we bring the con following conclusion. What's the most authentic book after the book of Allah? Sahih al-Bukhari only mentions, so the point number one, which is what? Sahih al-Bukhari only mentions that Abdurrahman ibn Auf took the opinion of the six only. That's what's in Sahih al-Bukhari. Are you with me? That's what's in Sahih al-Bukhari. Number two, point number two, what we take from this is that there are narrations that that Ibn Jarir al and others bring them. And if you bring those chains of narrations, and Allah loves justice and fairness. يُقَوِّ بَعْضُهَا بَعْضًا That strengthen one another. There are, the second one is, there are narrations that if you do bring them together, they strengthen one another that Abdurrahman ibn Auf consulted the noble people, the noble people, and I say again, 
the noble people of Medina. Are you with me? He has a response, don't worry. Who did he consult? The noble people of? Some of them will say, there you go, exactly. Allahu Akbar, at least you admitted that. We'll say there's an answer to that. Just give us a couple of minutes. Point number three. These are the conclusions that we take from it. Point number three, which is the story that says that Abdul Rahman ibn Auf consulted women. This, as we said, there's no chain for it. And there's no asal for it. Are you with me? If you look in the books of the Sunnah, you will find it. I'm not the one who said that. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah said that. And many other scholars have said that. So where did the scholars take it from? That this issue. Well, it seems like they took it from Ibn Ishaq. Ibn Ishaq took it from Ibn Hisham. So, so Ibn Ishaq was the one who brought it. And Ibn Hisham took it from Ibn Ishaq. And Ibn Kathir took it on. And no one ever brought it with any chain. There was no chain. And anyone who knows hadith knows the credibility of these individuals when it comes to hadith other than Ibn Kathir. Ibn Hisham and also Ibn Ishaq. What were they like in terms of hadith? And how, what was their level? Look at the books of hadith, inshallah ta'ala. You will see what's been said about them. And they don't give importance to chain. They only just love to bring to you events that took place. But the books that gave emphasis to the asanid and riwayat, you don't find that in it. Are you with me? And I'm not shocked that some of these people who bring this forward they have no portion in what? in Ilm al-Hadith are you with me? they don't very good <laughs> but you know what let's entertain the idea let's entertain what let's entertain that narration let's say it exists let's say it's what sorry how does that sound is that fair who say exists no Senate Bawi Senate Ali exists Fidawi in the Sunnah it's a hadith authentic let's just say that Abdul Rahman ibn Auf opposed the Prophet Ali and he opposed the path of who? Abu Bakr, Umar and Uthman. Are you with me? How did he oppose the Prophet Ali The Messenger Ali did not consult any woman when he went, when he appointed Akra ibn Habis and Uyayna. He didn't consult any woman. Neither did he consult his wives, nor did he consult any other woman. And the story is in Sahih Bukhari. When the Prophet ﷺ had died, the Sahabas we took Abu Bakr and Umar, they didn't. So Abdul Rahman ibn Auf went against the path of who? The Prophet and who? Sah. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. The second answer would be Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, even if he, even if he did consult women, he consulted based on the narrations. If we bring them together, Ashraf, the noble people. So the interpretation would be the interp it would be the noble women, the righteous women. But you, your election, the prostitute, she can elect. So why are you trying to use a story that doesn't have for you any evidence? Now, 
you see the permissibility of the fajara, the prostitute and the criminal, should be consulted. He consulted the righteous ones. That's if we say that then the wedding women is found somewhere. So we now put this question forward. Are you going to take the narration which we said Tabarani narrated, which is Sahih, that he consulted Asharafu Ahl Medina, and let's, for sake of argument, bring the other riwayah that the women were part of the Asharafu, the people of Medina. Are you with me? Are you there? Are you going to say Abdul Rahman Auf consulted the righteous people? Brothers, are you with me? Based on the narration he did, right? Would anybody say Abdul Rahman Auf consulted anyone bad? Then the argument's gone. Election is not based on that. If you say no, he only elected. He oh, he consulted the. He consulted. He consulted the bad people, right? Your argument also drops because election it chooses the righteous people as well. <coughs> Are you with me? The third point is if you say <coughs> both Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, he consulted both of them. They will say the narration doesn't support you on that. Does that make sense? The supposed narration that you're using doesn't support you. So we say, Aina thara min thraya. But then some would say, Abdurrahman ibn Auf, at least he consulted the people of Medina. Was the Khilafah exclusive to Medina? Iraq was in there. Mecca and Medina were in there. Would you call it Yemen was in there? What happened? Why were they not consulted? Is that what election is? Election is every single. Not only London is consulted. Birmingham is also consulted. I'm sorry, Birmingham also elects. They all do, right? Is the election only happened from London? Is that election? We're talking about general election. It doesn't fall according to your definition of election then. It's something that the widow who just lost her husband, she will laugh. She would laugh on this statement of yours. So the next shubha that they bring forward is known as, um, they'll say to you, إِنَّهَا مَسْأَلَ إِجْتِهَادِيَ It's an ijtihadi related matter. So we say to them, what do you mean by ijtihadi related matter? What do you mean? That it's an ijtihadi related matter. Expand it onto us. The response they can give is as follows. One is that it's a new issue. It's a new issue. Hasn't happened before. It wasn't known at the time of revelation. And it wasn't known at the time of the Khulafa al-Rashidin. And the response to this is from two angles. The response to this is from two angles. Point number one is this actually nullifies what you've just previously mentioned. It nullifies the first shubha which you brought that this was practiced by the early generation. That Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu was elected and that Umar was elected and Uthman was elected. And that's the reality of anyone who opposes the truth. He's always going to, always going to contradict himself. Second response is that second response is that just because something didn't happen at the time of the Salaf and it's a new issue, it doesn't always mean it's always left for ijtihad. Oh, no, 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 no. And that the person who opposes is not basically rebuked or scolded. La inkara al muhalif The one who opposes you, you know, you don't actually rebuke him or scold him for it. Rather, the scholars... They revise every situation independently. And they take it back to usul and kulliyat. And they examine it on the angle of al-ashbah wa nadair If they resemble something, if there are difference. And then they place a ruling whether it is mubah or mahadur, haram or whether it is wajib or And we've just previously mentioned the mafasid that are in it. Some of which being giving a person the right to legislate on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
and endorsing that person. So that is enough to show you that it's haram. Second, answer that they can give is what? There is no textual evidence for it. It's, we, when we say it's ijtihadi, what we're trying to say is, lam yarid fiha nasun. There's no textual evidence for it. The previous answers that we gave is enough for it. The third is that we agree that it's haram. And we see the, the prohibition of it. But we believe the reason why we're entering into it is because it will fulfill masalih. Benefits are going to come from it. And those masalih cannot be attained unless we enter into it or unless we do the elections. Whereas you, you have Salafiyun, you Salafis, you guys see it as mafsada in entering it. In other words, we differ on tahqiqul malat. Which is what? Is what's going to come out of it? A maslaha or a mafsada? And then after that, we differ on the application of it. Placing the ruling and then the application on the reality that we're, really, we're living in. So that's what we mean by تَخْتَلِفُ فِيهِ الْأَنْبَارِ The way that people look at it and observe it, it differs. فَلَا يُنْكَرُ عَلَىٰ أَحَدٍ So don't scold a person on this. The response for this is what? If we would ever have surrendered this argument, if we would have accepted this from you, it would have been 60 years ago. 60 years ago. When this idea was put forward, the democracy systems were brought to the Muslim countries. When Muslims were electing in this country and they were choosing... Experience has taught us enough. We've seen that the mafasid are more. You're living in Kukulad. You want half of half a century's experience. Just uh, just approximately half a century. It's experience that we acquired and we gained. You want us to what? Not forget it. Toss it over our shoulders. And the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, لا يدلغ المؤمن من جحر واحد مرتين A believer is not beaten from the same hole twice. Why? Because he learned from me yesterday. Can you get bitter from the same hole every day? If you get bitter from the same hole twice every day, something's wrong with you. If you say that it is a masala which is the next way, way you can when we asked you what it means, what do you mean by ijtihadiyah? The next thing you could say is that <coughs> is it's a dispute amongst the scholars. The scholars differ amongst themselves this issue. And it is not a matter of consent. So they say it's a mas'ala ijtihadiyah, meaning it's a dispute amongst the ulama. And there's no consent. There's no consent. Now I want to say, my beloved brothers and sisters, the qa'idah which I want everybody to memorize, which is, ليس كل خلاف جاء معتبرا. Not every khilaf that comes is given consideration. إِلَّا مَا كَانَ لَهُ حَظُّ مِنَ النَّظَرِ Except a khilaf that deserves to be looked at. There are some issues which had khilaf in it and the sahabas were very staunch on it. كَبْلُ عَبَّاسَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَ عَنْهُ The issue of what? حَجُّ التَّمَتُّعُ 
What did he say? أقول لكم قال الله. He, they asked him. He gave a verdict. They said Abu Bakr and Umar. I ask you today, is anyone greater than Abu Bakr and Umar today? Yeah. No. Is there any scholar greater than Abu Bakr and Umar? No. Ibn Abbas did not accept Abu Bakr and Umar. Why do you accuse him? Why does he want to? Because he has a delil. He has a nas in front of him. He has an extra, he's got a textual evidence in front of him. He said to them, "Aqulu lakum qala Allah qala Rasulu." I am saying to Allah said, His messenger said, "Wa taqulu li qala Abu Bakr Umar." And you're gonna now come and tell me Abu Bakr and Umar said. You know what? I, I fear. He said, "Aksha." I fear and tunzila alaykum that it sent unto you min al-sama hijarat min al-nar stones from hellfire on your heads each each one's head and destroys you like wa arsal alayhim tayran ababil tarmihim bi hijarat min sijil each rock had a name of the person who's going to hear I'm scared that's going to happen to you guys and that Destruction he's talking about. Masala fiqhiyya. Tamattu. They can say Abu Bakr, say Umar. Who are promised Jannah alive. Some people, the way they speak is driving Da'wah Salafiyya back in the sense where it's taking people to become like Sufis. So what were we refuting? And what the years of effort that we were putting in telling the people of Ahlul Madhab who were taqlid a'ma, blind following of a madhab. إِذَا قَالَتْ حَذَامِي فَصَدِّقُوهَا فَإِنَّ الْقَوْلَ مَا قَالَتْ حَذَامِي A man said, أَنَا رَجُلٌ I'm a man from the people of Ghuzay, I think he said. إِنْ غَوَتْ غَوَيْتُ وَإِنْ تَرْشَدْ أَرْشُدْ So because this guy, I'm misguided with them. So they become guided, I'm guided with them. I'm a man of my people. Some people, that's, they want, that's what they want from you. وَلِذَلْكِ بْنُ الْقَيِّمِ مِنِ سْكِتَابِ إِعْلَامِ And I advise students to look at it. He talks about this issue of when a scholar goes against the textual evidences and goes against the delil, how a believer should, what? Deal with this particular issue. Knowing the status and the rank of these ulama, these jahabidat al nuqat knowing that they are between either two reward or one reward. Either way, he's going to go home with reward. Rahimahumullahu jami'an. And not trying to belittle them, let alone do takfir on them. Like some jahala gawa, ignorant people. Who can't even read Fatiha? Doing takfir of Ibn Baz, Ibn Uthaymeen, and Al Albani. Atahajuhu wa lastalahu bi kufin fa sharrukuma li khayrukuma al fida. You're not even like his nails. But what we say is, even then, you are commanded to follow the textual evidence. Wa tabi'u ma unzila ilaykum min rabbikum, wa la tabi'u min dunihi awliya. قليلا ما تذكرون little are the ones who actually ponder on that and little are the ones who actually see that not everybody realizes that and it's one of the ways that shaitan whispers to the people he brings to you the status of a person and makes you go against the delil these same ulama are the ones who taught us ittiba'u al-dalil following the delil they're the ones we learnt it from after Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala. They're the ones who you don't open a book of theirs except when they say something they give you the delivery for it. One of the things I read from Sheikh Al-Bani's life was what? On his deathbed before he died some of his students they disagreed with him on a position he took. I don't remember was it a grading of a hadith or was it based on a fatwa, fiqh issue? It was something and they disagreed with him. And he was happy that they did this. 
He was happy that he left behind students. يُعَظِّمُونَ النصوص Who honor the textual evidence. So it made him happy. And he said words of pleasement, that he was pleased with their position, that they saw the evidence was with, was it with, that it was not, that they saw the evidence and they took it on board. And Imam al-Shafi'i went to Misr and he saw the people of Egypt blind following, excessively fanatic towards Imam Malik. And Imam al-Shafi'i wrote a book of refutation of Imam Malik. The mistakes that Imam Malik did. Who is Imam Malik? Shaykhu. His teacher. That he took knowledge from. And that he what? So the person has to know that the Dalil should be given importance to. Why? It's because, as some of the Salaf used to say, Zallatul Alim, Zallatul Alam. The slip of a scholar is the slip of the universe, the world. When the scholar slips and does a mistake, whoa, the world goes with him. So the person should be at tahari al tiba'il haq. You have to strive hard in wanting to follow the truth. Or else you're going to turn your religions into the religions of the Christians and that. They go to the priest. They tell him, they confess to him. Do you think it reached this point except bitadarruj, gradually? It reached that level bitadarruj, gradually. When they stopped ta'zimun nusus, honoring and respecting the textual evidence. And yes, my beloved brothers and sisters, there are people, laysa lahum ahliyah, they have no right to look at the textual evidence. But I am not going to rebuke them for bringing me an evidence. Hadi min al jahalat, for a person who brings you a dalil, to say, who are you to bring me the dalil? I will never say that, and no one can say that. Kada hum qun wa junun, thim witness. But what you say to them is, Jazakallah for bringing dalil and honoring the kitab and the sunnah, and seeing that this is a proof for you. We honor you for that, and you are a praiseworthy person for that. But who understood it like this? And how was the evidence taken out of this like this? 